Hello and welcome to Decoding the New Economy. Today I'm with Mark Peschke, the founder and CEO of Moore's Cloud. And we're going to discuss uh, the Internet of Everything, the pivoting from one business idea to another, and some of the perils of crowdsourcing as well. Mark, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Paul. So to kick off, let's talk about what uh, Moore's Cloud is. Right. So Moore's Cloud is an Internet of Things company. We're focusing specifically on lighting. The idea is, of course, everything will soon be connected. You probably already have between 10 and 20 connected devices at home. By the end of this decade, that'll be closer to 200. Mm. By the end of the next decade, probably closer to 2,000. So all the devices will be connected. We've taken one specific approach, which is lighting, which is something that we think is quite, I think, both interesting and also has a capacity to express emotion and information in really nice ways. And our first product is what you see before you. It's Holiday by Moore's Cloud. They are the world's first intelligent fairy lights. Right. Now, how did the idea come about? Well, last year when we launched the company, we had a different form factor, a device called the light, which was a small cube, quite designerly mm. looking. Again, had a whole bunch of LEDs in it. Again, was intelligent, internet connected, could be controlled. And we went out on Kickstarter and raised about two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars in a campaign that fell over because we were looking for seven hundred thousand. So we, we knew that there was a market here, but what we also understood was that it was actually very difficult to explain what the device did because people expect lights to turn on and off. Right. Because that's what lights have always done. Maybe you can dim them, but that's pretty much the range for a light. It's on and off and maybe somewhere in between on and off. And so we found ourselves sort of stumbling, particularly with an investor, when you're trying to ask them for money, mm. what is this? Why do people need this? And we tossed out a bunch of other ideas that we wanted to work on after we got the light out, and one of them would seem quite natural was to do Christmas lights. Right. As we had discussions with people, this was over the end of last year and early this year, everyone perked up mm. when we talked about Christmas lights, and it became clearer and clearer that, in fact, actually that's what we should do. So what we did was we took exactly the same technology, same hardware platform, same software platform that we built for the light mm. and put it in a different form factor. So it's as if we took the light and unwound it right. into a string. So, and that's a classic business pivot. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, and it was driven by listening to what people were responding to. And what we understood was that where a light, again, is something that turns on and off, people ascribe all sorts of interesting qualities to fairy lights. Now, really, fairy mm. lights, the only thing they've really ever done is so blink, right? Uh, maybe bubble if you had the old kind of bubbler kinds. Yep. But they they weren't that magical, but their associations are magical and they're fairy lights and they can do all this great stuff. And so really what we're doing is we're fulfilling the expectations for people. Mm. Yeah. Now just going back to that Kickstarter mm. campaign, we hear a lot about successful ones, mm. but yours fell short. Mm -hmm. What were the learnings that you had from that? Oh my gosh, so many. First is I think I'd probably rather eat a bullet than do a Kickstarter <laughs> campaign again. I, it was you know, people say that it's a better way than getting investors, and I actually have to say that it's not better, it's just different. Right. right. I think that, and in fact, we were approached by the CEO of Indiegogo, who is amazing, Slava Rubin, and he said, Mark, you should really ask for less money, $200,000, and then overshoot the goal, and that's how mm. you get your money. And I was afraid to do that because I didn't want us to be caught in a sort of no man's land between having some money and having yes. it in hand and not really having enough money to execute. So we set the goal too high. And the problem with that was psychological. So people would contribute to the goal, but their contribution would only raise the needle a tiny little amount. Mm. And so you really have to think about how you're building feedbacks into a crowd campaign so that people feel like not only are they contributing, but they're helping you move the goal. Because yeah. once a campaign is fully funded on Kickstarter, it tends to get overfunded. This right. is the thing. It's because people are now piling in because they see it as being successful, and people don't want to be part of something that's not successful, even though that is no reflection on them. Yes. So there's a whole bunch of psychology that you really need to understand that I did not understand going in mm. that would lead me to do things differently. So you create a goal that's low enough that can be achieved. If we'd had a goal for $200,000, we probably would have filled that in the first two weeks and then simply gone right. over it after that and so on and so forth. So there are different ways of approaching that. But the other thing is that when you do a crowdfunding campaign, you have to be customer focused from day one. So you have to build a marketing campaign and a customer information awareness and uh, retention campaign from day one. So it's not something that you need to do, for instance, like with the holiday, because we did this through straight investment. Yeah. Now that we're ready to ship the product, we're building all the customer infrastructure. We haven't had to worry about that beforehand. But with the Kickstarter campaign, you're actually going to do that in reverse. Right. 
Yeah, so that makes it, um, there's quite a bit of a gamble there, but it seems to me that you're building a community with, um, yes. with it before that. Now on that community side, uh, so the uh, the lights are all open source and you're looking at building a developer community around that? Yeah, well we already, I mean all of the developer tools are already up on GitHub, basically right. all of, almost all of our source code. As soon as we release, the rest of the source code will go up on GitHub, because mm. the thought is that we're creating something that is both beautiful and playful, but that we actually want other people to play with. Mm. And that's the key, is that it's not just about you're buying a set of Christmas lights that are really fancy and expensive and you can control with your smartphone. Yeah. It's that what we've done is we've given you something where there's no end of possibility. So mm. there's a tiny little company called The Secret Lab down in Hobart right now, right. and they're writing an iPhone app mm. that allows you to plug in iTunes right. so that you can play and visualize music onto our stream. Mm. All right? And that's just the sort of tip of what's possible with all these things. It's a very natural tip, but it's a tip. And it's because we've documented everything very clearly for them. It was very easy for them to write code. They're going to actually take some of that code and put that up and publicly share it and so on and so forth. Because yeah. we really want to be able to create, I guess, a whole community of people who are both sharing and creating. Mm. And that's good for us because we'll end up selling more lights because the lights become more useful. But it's also good for everyone else because everyone else is learning from everyone. Right. Yeah, and that seems to be uh, really the opportunities with the open source there of creating more applications. What sort of applications do you see down the track with that? Well, I mean, it, it's, it is interesting because it depends on who you ask, all right. right? So if you ask a programmer, every time they say, oh, we want to build light, so that you, know, you can mm -hmm. say, you know, that's Bob's light and that's Ted's light and Ted's light's red because he broke the build right now and so on and so right. forth. So a programmer immediately sees it like that. Someone who's into the footy are like, hey, can I actually get my team colors over there and the opposing team colors over there and they'll go back and forth mm. as the footy score evolves and so the answer is yes, you can do that. Um, someone who's in marketing may want to use sentiment analysis so that the tweet stream or how often a keyword is being mentioned is being visualized across right. it. So really the uses are as varied as the communities who understand what the possibilities are. Mm. And that's one reason why this is open. It's because we know there's only a few of us. There's six people at Morse Tide, right? We can't right. cover all the bases. What sure. we can do is put something out there and say, okay, folks, here's some ways to start covering those bases. Mm. Right. Now, where do you see Morse Tide being in five years' time? Well, our, go our stated goal is to have 1% of the international market in fairy lights, which doesn't sound like much, but the international market in fairy lights is about $10 billion a year. Right. All right, so in five years' time, we want 1% of that, $100 million. Yeah. Uh, we're building a software base called the Internet of Things Access Server, or IOTIS, which runs on all of our devices. It's embedded in all of our devices, but the goal there is that it's also designed to be able to control other devices in the house. Okay. So it can control your Philips Hue bulbs, it can control your Wemo outlet adapters, it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is actually build a platform for services. Yeah so that other people can write apps that don't just control our lights, but control all of your lights, or control all of your outlets, or whatever it might be. Because we see that being the traffic cop there, because every device has its own interfaces, its own APIs, yep. that actually presenting a unified API gives developers a write once run anywhere solution. And we think that that's gonna be a good place to be as well. Yeah, so you see yourself as being the control panel for the connected home? Yes, and the app store. Right. Ideally, or probably just one of the app stores, but nonetheless, we yeah. want to be the app store for the connected home. That sounds like a really exciting project there, Mark. And where can people buy uh, Holiday from? So you can buy it online right now at holiday.morsecloud.com, and mm -hmm. Australians will be able to buy it through our retail partnership, but we haven't announced that. We're going to announce that in a couple of weeks. Okay, well, I look forward to that, Mark. Yeah. And thank you very much for joining us at Decoding the New Economy.